Hi guys, I'm Peter Birch and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification button to continue to join the adventure. Today guys, I wanna talk a little bit about breeding snakes. It's getting close to that time of the year for us. So welcome to Criticam. So today guys, I wanna talk a little bit about breeding pythons. Now, there's so many things that we're going to take into consideration and I find that there's so many different facets to what's got to happen before it actually happens. Um, this time of the year here in Australia, it's, we're heading into winter and it's cooling down, so therefore we're getting close to breeding. And um, what I like to do early in the season is start putting animals together just to see if they're actually um, compatible. Because I think that's a big factor is the animals need to be a bit compatible. So making sure that the animals get on fine, you know, and can deal with each other. That's the most important thing. There's no use putting a male and female together and they're not compatible. And sometimes out of aggression, you'll get the animals and they'll attack each other. And, and it's a weird, obscure thing, but it will happen. So. Like I said, this time of the year, I'm, I'm just putting some animals together for some rough indications to see if they're compatible. And of course, what these guys are doing is, you know, they're getting really excited. Now, taking it into that, of, before we even get to this event, maybe I should wind back the clock a bit. So, you know, we stop feeding. Um, we leave them for a couple of weeks to make sure that they've passed all the fecal matter. Uh, they've cleaned themselves out. So therefore, when we start the cooling cycle, it's not gonna have any detrimental effect to their intestines and their stomachs and all the rest of that, making sure that their bowels are completely emptied. Uh, and, and of course, when you put these guys together, sometimes they get a little bit excited and in a few of these cages already, you know, they're pushed out a little bit extra defecation. And of course, that's always a pain in the bum because you think you've just covered all your bases and then bam, there's another one just pops out and flops on the floor. Absolutely crazy. Now, with the bigger pythons and the smaller pythons, I find there's different levels of stuff, uh, different timings, different amount of cooling prior to putting animals together. All that sort of thing is very important. And it doesn't hurt to start a little bit early, like I said, just to feel it out and see where we're going and see what's happening and making sure it's heading in the right direction. Now, when it comes to the anteresia, the dirt snakes, of course, you know, boom, I've got that sort of back to front, up and down, all ready to go. Now, when you're putting these guys together, um, we usually put them together in the early part of the cooling part of the season. Uh, there again, you know, you'll, you'll get some initial matings. Um, I wouldn't be counting on those initial matings as being the mating that does the job. Although I have had a few animals only mate once or twice and produce a really awesome clutch of eggs. Now, as everyone knows, I do a lot of maternal incubation. Uh, that's a personal choice and I really enjoy it. I really get a lot of enjoyment out of watching the females do exactly what they need to do and that they mimic so much in the wild. And me as a keeper, I get to learn so much just by watching what these guys have done, how they've coiled up around their eggs. The temperatures that they've picked to lay their eggs is a very in great indication of maybe temperatures that is a really good temperature to incubate eggs because in captivity we tend to uh, cook them a little bit higher so that they cook a little bit quicker and they come out early, but um, I found maternal incubation always typically produced larger, healthier babies, um, very robust and grow on the food very quickly. But, you know, we're, we're dealing with tiny little little giant earthworms basically in some instances. Now, when um, you put these guys together in some of these, um, some of these boxes, like I said, you know, I've put them together and straight away, you know, they've emptied their bowels. But also some of the cool factors, I've always put clean butcher's paper in. So therefore you can see exactly what's going on. Um, in this indication, we can see here, um, this right here, that there is a sperm plug. So this is the male right here. So at some point he's been excited enough to push out his sperm plug um, and get himself ready for the season. Uh, down here in another box, here again, we've got a little bit of feces. Someone's got excited again, but more importantly, when we look here, you can see these tiny little smear marks. Now, they almost look like little blood trails. Now, what that is, is the females are releasing a hormone. They're dropping down a scent trail and musking it up so that the males can follow that. So you gotta think naturally in the bush, the females will come into season. They would leave a little musk trail, move through the bush and then one or two males would cross that path, 
if the males find each other, then they'll have a little bit of a, a tuffle. And whoever wins will then continue the, the journey to find the female that's susceptible or ready to mate, mate ready to mate. And um, he'll get down there and do his job and then his genes get carried on to the next generation, which is pretty important. And that's exactly what they do out there in the bush. So it's good indication to see what they're doing in captivity. Now with the bigger snakes, like I said before, they do a very similar thing. This is the same thing basically. They, um, they get in there and um, empty out the rest of their bowels, which is absolutely fantastic. Because, you know, as a reptile keeper, we just love cleaning and cleaning and cleaning. It's just a constant, constant thing. Now, with the big snakes, the same with the little snakes, you've got to give them at least 26 really good feeds throughout the year in between breeding and the next cycle around to the next breeding season to ensure that you're going to get another really cool clutch of eggs. Now, with these particular dirt snakes, and the fact that I do a lot of maternal incubation, I get a lot of people asking me, why do you do it, number one? Number two is, how does it affect the females in the following season? And number three, you know, the females aren't eating, so therefore they're not gonna be able to get their body weight back up and not be able to produce another clutch of eggs the following season. And I guess most people get a little bit worried because, you know, they're worried about continuing to prove or produce eggs and babies but here for instance here's a female that um, has done maternal incubation for the last five years now and um, she's got great body mass she gets her 26 good feeds after she gets off the eggs sometimes when she's on the eggs I'll give her a half feed so a much smaller mouse she'll take that eat it move away do everything she needs to do and you know great condition on this animal and she'll just continue to do that as long as I'm aware of what she requires in between, um, making sure that there's always good, clean, fresh water and making sure that she's got those really good, nutritious feeds. She's just trying to make a jail break here. Really good, nutritious feeds in between to make sure that she continues to hold up that body weight, which is pretty important. Now for the Antaresia, I really find a minimum body weight of males to be around about the 100 grams mark and the females 250 grams. Now my advice is let the females get a little bit bigger guys. 350, 400 grams is sort of the ideal body weight we wanna get for those big females. They're gonna give you a nice big healthy clutch. The females are gonna maintain some nice body weight to be able to carry that through to the next season, regardless if you wanna do maternal incubation or artificial incubation. That's completely up to you. That's a personal choice. For me, I like maternal and you know, Artificial incubation is very handy as well. So it all depends on how many clutches I've got going and how much stuff's happening. And I mean, this is a new environment here. This is the new room that I've created. So I'm a little bit wary, but um, at the moment, the indication here, the nighttime temperatures in this part of the world, you know, we're getting down to about seven, six degrees at night. So we're in the single degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit, Celsius. Um, I like to keep my reptile room, this particular room about 15, 18 degrees at night during this time of the year. Um, apart from that, when it gets warmer during the year, it'll get warmer as well. So, you know, I turn my thermostats down, maintain a nice hot spot, and make sure that these guys still got a nice hot spot all the time in these small V35s around 25 to 28 degrees. That's pretty important. So the females can move in and out those temperature zones. Everyone gets a little bit flustered about dropping temperatures, consistently keeping them low we're gonna give ourselves some really bad problems with respiratory infection. Now, it starts off in the mouth, then they breathe it down into their lungs, and then it causes all sorts of horrible things. So, you know, it, it's easier just to keep them a little bit warmer, and you might miss one or two females, but I mean, that's a given. Uh, I mean, it all depends on what you're planning to do. Now, as a, as a producer of animals for pets, I guess you wanna make as many babies as you can, as quickly as you can. But the reality is, what are you going to do when you do produce some babies or get some eggs? Are you prepared? You gotta make sure you guys are prepared for what comes next. Do study now, start working out exactly now. If I get eggs, how am I gonna cook them? Am I gonna do artificial incubation or am I gonna do maternal incubation? And then when the babies hatch, what am I gonna do next? Some of these things are absolute nightmares to get feeding and Nine, I've had so many people approach me and say, yeah, I bred my snakes, 
but I can't get them to feed. Can you help me? It's like, well, you should have done your homework, number one. Number two, yes, I can help, but I can't physically go to everybody's place and help. It's a little bit time consuming, especially when I've got my own stuff to work on. So you guys need to be very prepared, prepared for eggs, prepared for babies. And then what happens if you can't sell your babies? Another dilemma. So guys, you've got to really do a little bit of homework when it comes to breeding animals. Now, um, I guess that's it pretty much in a nutshell for now. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did enjoy, make sure you hit that like button. Hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time, guys, I'll be here uh, checking out on babies or checking out these snakes, hoping that I'm going to get some eggs this season and making sure that I'm prepared just like you guys should. Thanks for watching Critter Cam, guys.